Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm your host, Aya Takase, and I am here with our presenters, Keisuke Saito and Tim Brado. Hello. Thank you for joining us for our webinar series, Beneath the Surface, X-ray Analysis of Battery Materials and Structure. In this webinar series, we will discuss how to leverage X-ray analysis techniques to gain insights into battery performance. Our expert speakers will share the best practices and real-world applications. But before we start, a few housekeeping items. This is going to be an interactive session, and I will be posting relevant links in the chat window. And we'll be taking your questions live during the webcast and answering them during the session. So please don't wait until the end to ask. And please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We won't be monitoring the raised hand function, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar, and we'll respond to any unanswered questions uh, directly after the session is complete. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. So, okay, um, with that said, I will turn it over to Keisuke and Tim. Thank you, Aya. So again, my name is Keisuke. Welcome to the second part of the webinar series. So this time I'm going to discuss how to run in Operando XRD experiments. So today we will discuss and you will learn, uh, first of all, what XRD Operando can tell you. So secondary operando sample stages. So for operando XRD, we need to have a dedicated sample stage uh, on the XRD side. So I'm gonna discuss what kind of available sample stages uh, available in the market. So then I'm gonna discuss a little bit about how to prepare your samples uh, in uh, XRD operando sample stages. So then uh, I will discuss how to set up your experiments. So how to synchronize XRD and operando measurements. So today I prepared some of the examples. So first of all, uh, this is about intercalation of lithium ions. So this is a classic, most typical operando XRD measurement and analysis. And also I do have an example on the C-rate dependency. So it means, uh, so if you accelerate your charging and discharging, so what's happened on your sample? So one day I try to see it through X-ray diffraction. Uh, the other example uh, today I have is a solid state battery. As, as we know, the solid state battery is uh, one of the hot topic in the research and the development field. And I have one example today. And then another example is a temperature dependent operando X-ray measurement. So now you can control the temperature of your battery to see how your structure uh, performs under the temperature condition in terms of its potential start, uh, battery property, and the crystal structure from X-ray diffraction. So then finally, I will summarize my talk. Let me start from what XRD operando can tell you. So we prepare the battery structure, for example, uh, the pouch, in the pouch. So we put cathode and electrolyte and anode, and we connect this pouch to the potential start. So this is how we measure the electrical properties on your batteries. If you joined last time of the webinar series, it was a month ago. Uh, so we discussed two different XRD geometries. So one was a refraction geometry. So refraction geometry, X-ray hits a pouch from one side of the pouch surface like this schematic drawing, and then diffracted X-ray to the same side of the pouch are recorded by detector. So this is called refraction geometry. So for this geometry, you could use a copper, cobalt, molybdenum, silver X-ray radiations. This is not materials in your battery. This is a X-ray uh, for this measurement. So refraction geometry is more sensitive to the surface side of the pouch. So I mean, surface side is a side of the pouch where the X-ray is hitting. Because penetration of the X-ray is limited, so the X-ray diffraction, what you get out of this measurement is more from the surface side on the pouch cell. 
On the other hand, the transmission geometry requires harder X-ray. So harder X-ray means shorter wavelength or higher energy of X-rays. For example, molybdenum or silver X-ray source are required. The transmission measurement uh, X-rays going through transmit through your pouch sample. So that's why you get all the X-ray peaks from all the materials in the pouch. So including cathode, anode, electrolyte, so you get everything. So out of the operando XRD, so what you can discuss, what you can analyze is the crystal and the semi-crystal structures. So crystal structure means size of the crystal, the, the particle size, grain size. So these kinds of things could be discussed, analyzed by X-ray diffraction. So by that way, so you can synchronize between potential start electric, electrical properties and structure from the XRD. So there are different application of field using X-ray scattering. So uh, to, this scattering technology analyzes like a local structure of your sample and amorphous. So this application is called pair distribution function. So this PDF or pair distribution function is discussed in the following webinar series, which is scheduled in February next year. So if you are interested in PDF application, please join us. So this example is showing what kind of information we can extract out of the XRD under the operando. So this is showing XRD patterns of lithium cobalt oxide with different X, so means lithium concentration. On the top in the red, so this is lithium one, cobalt one, oxygen two. So in this structure, the lithium is 100% intercalated or incorporated into the cobalt oxide layer structures. So this state is fully discharged state. So next example in the blue. So this one has lithium 0.75. So I mean 75% of the lithium atomic sites are occupied by lithium ion. And then finally green, it has only 27% lithium in the cobalt oxide layer structure. So if you have a look, LC003 peak, this is the first peak on the left-hand side, just below 20 degree to theta angle. So this peak is moving depending on the lithium concentration. This happens because under the discharging and the charging, the lithium ion is moving in and moving out from the lithium cobalt oxide structure. By removing or by having the lithium in the crystal structure, the lattice parameters here. So this is the size of the crystal changes, elongated, shrinked, elongated, shrinked. So this happens all the time under the operando condition. So that's why our X-ray peak shift. So it means X-ray diffraction is sensitive to the lattice parameter or lattice constants of your materials. Okay, so we're going to take a break and we want to ask you guys in the audience the question. So let me start the first polling question. Okay. So Keisuke wanted to ask you if you have ever tried operando XRD before. You can choose either yes or no. Oh, the votes are coming in pretty fast. Yep. So over 70% of you answered. I'm going to give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. And I'm going to end the poll and share the results. 94% mm -hmm. people said no. Okay, I hope you'll welcome. be convinced that this is something you want to try by <laughs> this webinar. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you for your contribution. Yeah, thanks, Aya. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Right. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's continue. So in this section, I'd like to discuss operando sample stages. As I mentioned at the beginning, to do operando XRD, so we need to have a dedicated sample holder. So let me discuss that. So as we found, X-ray diffraction has two different geometries. 
are refraction and transmission. For refraction, once again, you may use copper, cobalt, molybdenum, or silver X-ray radiation. So for this geometry, so we have battery cell, or sometimes it is called electrochemical cell. So in the battery cell, so this top part of the uh, stainless steel made like a round shape. So this part is a sample holder. So you structure your batteries like a cathode, uh, electrolyte, and the anode, and some spacers and separators, uh, glass fibers, whatever you want to integrate. So you structure in this chamber. So then there is a small window in the middle. So this is a window for X-ray. Typically, we use aluminum. Especially when you have a soft X-rays like a copper or a cobalt, the window should be very thin. So normally we recommend an aluminum window because aluminum is kind of a light element for X-ray. X-ray transmits better. But thickness should be less than 20 micrometer thick. So this is the kind of requirement in terms of the window materials. The other sample holder is for solid state batteries. The difference between uh, the battery cell on the left and the right, for the solid state, uh, we can pressurize your structure. Because everything is now solid state, even electrolyte. Just to make sure the physical contact between the cathode, anode, electrolyte, so we pressurize the structure. So means the one on the left-hand side, so we typically use this battery cell for liquid-based lithium-ion batteries. The another example is the coin cell. So if you would like to prepare your sample structure in the coin cell, the coin cell sample holder for X-ray diffraction is also available in the market. So the coin cell has a round shape. So this is the coin cell itself. And in the middle, so you see a yellow foil. So this is Capton. So Capton is almost transparent for X-ray. So means this is a window for X-ray and we structure your sample structure under the capiton foil. For transmission, uh, we use either molybdenum or silver radiation. So then uh, we do have as uh, a single point pouch cell. So single point means we measure only the center part of the pouch. The other option would be XY mapping combined pouch cell. So with this, so you can do spatial mapping. So you can now move pouch cell X and Y direction so that you see a spatial distribution of your battery structure on your pouch. The other application or option could be temperature controlled pouch cell. So this is for single point. So you measure only center of the pouch, but now you can control the temperature. So you may ask me a little more detailed specification I'm going to discuss later on, but you can control the temperature on the pouch, and then you can carry on XRD operando. And the coin cell for transmission geometry is available in the market as well. But in this case, please make sure your coin cell has two capital windows, both surfaces of the coin cell, so that X-ray transmit well, through the structure. Just for your information, stainless steel, the coin cell case itself doesn't transmit X-ray, unfortunately. It is too much absorbing and also too thick. So please let me discuss a little more detailed specification for battery cell. So this is first of all airtight. We are supposed to prepare the sample in a glove box. And the temperature for Perando XRD is ambient temperature, room temperature. So then scan range for X-ray diffraction between 10 degree up to 160 degree, which is quite sufficient for Perando XRD measurement. Sample size in diameter is limited to 20 millimeter diameter maximum. The battery cell for solid state. So this is also airtight. We prepare the sample in glove box. The temperature is ambient, uh, scan range 10 to 120, a little shorter compared to battery cell on left, but 120 degree for X-ray diffraction is quite good enough to see the structure changes under the operando. Sample size, either 10 millimeter 
or 16 millimeter diameter pellet shape of the solid state battery are required. Uh, maximum thickness, so we accommodate a two millimeter maximum thickness on this sample stage. And we can pressurize maximum one kilonewton of the force, so which is equivalent to 12 megapascal if you have a 10 millimeter diameter pellet. The other option is the coin cell. So in our case, so we do support a 20 millimeter diameter coin cell with uh, three different thicknesses, 1.6, 2.5, and 3.2 millimeters. So temperature for measurement is gonna be ambient. Scan range, you can start XRD from three degree minimum to the angle. What about transmission stages? So this is a single point pouch cell. So temperature wise, it's done under the ambient temperature, scan range for X-ray diffraction three to 60. So which is smaller, if you remember the refraction geometry sample stages, uh, because for transmission, so we assume uh, uh, the high energy X-rays like a molybdenum or a silver to transmit through the structure. So by having the hard X-ray or shorter wavelength X-ray or high energy X-rays, so diffractogram is compressed. So if you joined the first part of the seminar, webinar, excuse me, last time, so we discussed that. If you missed, so we have a YouTube video in, on the YouTube, so please watch it out. So then we discuss how the diffractogram changes depending on the radiation used. Window for X-ray, so means here. So this diameter, we have two different versions, uh, 70 by 70 or 35 times 50 millimeter. X direction, horizontal direction. So you can move plus minus 25 millimeter and Y axis plus minus six millimeter. This is just to locate your pouch cell for X-ray diffraction measurement. But X is manual and Y is motorized. The pouch cell combined with a motorized XY stage. So temperature wise, it's ambient, scan range the same as a single point pouch cell. A window for X-ray, a little different from the single point which is 54 times 84 along the X direction. So you can move plus minus 40 millimeter and the Y direction plus minus 25 millimeter. A temperature controlled pouch cell. So you can control temperature from negative uh, 10 degrees Celsius up to positive 110 degree Celsius. So ramping rate, it's going to be maximum two degrees Celsius per minute. Uh, scan range for X-ray diffraction between three to 70 degrees. And maximum pouch sample size is 55 times 90 millimeter. Coin cell for transmission. So in our case, we do support the same uh, different thicknesses of the coin cells. Temperature is going to be ambient. The scan range are from three up to 80 degrees. So those are the specifications of the sample holders. So let me ask second questions. Well, let me start the next polling question. So the second question the case I had for you is, which attachment are you most interested in? So he showed you a couple of different types, and you can choose from liquid battery cell or solid state battery cell, or pouch cell, or coin cell, or maybe something else. So the votes are coming in real fast, and it's kind of evenly distributed, I would mm -hmm. say. Yep, I agree. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to think about it. And I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. And share the results. Mm -hmm. For some reason, nobody is interested in uh, liquid battery cell. Mm -hmm. But 30%, 31% uh, solid state battery, pouch cell 23%, and coin cell 38%. And 8% people said other. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't mind um, and type in what other attachment you're interested in the chat, you know, we, we would look into it. <laughs> yep, that'd be great. 
Thank you. So thank you for your help. All right. So let me continue them. Yeah, this was the last part of the sample whole stages. So Tim, just in case, if you received uh, the questions, I may take one question for now. Okay. Yes, uh, we have one question here. Are the transmission stages for both liquids and solids? Uh, transmission stage uh, for both liquids. Yes. So pouch cell, for example. So you can prepare either liquid based or solid based. And the coin cell, yes, yeah, so refraction transmission is available. But coin cell is typically used for liquid base because you cannot pressurize a structure. Yes, yeah, so you can do both refraction transmission for both uh, the liquid and the solid state batteries. Thank you. That's all we have for right now. Okay. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for everybody. All right. So let me continue. So this part, I'm going to discuss sample preparation because sample preparation is kind of key. To, to success the operando X-ray diffraction experiment. So to be clear, I prepared a couple of different videos for today. Um, so let me show you, let me share the video between us. I'm going to explain step by step how you could prepare your sample structure. So let me start from liquid-based lithium-ion battery case. So there is no sound, just in case if you wonder. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we need to prepare cathode. So in this case, aluminum uh, current collector or X-ray window, and then uh, the cathode is pasted on top of it. Uh, separator and a glass filter and anode. Spacer, spring-loaded spacer, typically they are supplied uh, together with the sample holder. And now we are going to assemble. So first we need to place a window of, for X-ray or cathode. So then we put our insulator on top of it. So then uh, we place the flange. For the airtight, uh, we have O-rings everywhere. So that's why this flange must be fixed by screws like this. Hey, only for video purpose, we are doing this preparation outside of the glove box, but as mentioned on the right top corner, so normally this is done in the glove box. So once you fix a, a sample holder, so we put a separator with the electrolyte on it. So then uh, we put glass filter. If your glass filter is really dry, so we strongly recommend to drop a cup of the electrolyte by micro pipette. So then uh, we put anode. So make sure your anode surface is facing towards cathode. So then we need to center the anode. So then depending on your thickness, if your thickness is really thick, so you may not need this kind of spacer. But if you have a typical uh, thickness uh, of the materials, so you need to have the spacer. So then uh, finally, we put another spacer with the spring on it. So this spring pressurizes very softly, gently uh, to your structure. So then we put the lid. And then uh, finally, we screw the lid to the sample holder. So that's it. So now we completed the preparation. So sample is ready. So next is diffractometer. So this is just our diffractometer as an example. So our diffractometer, you can exchange the sample stage easily like this. So I just removed the conventional sample stage and put the base uh, for the uh, battery cell. So then uh, you put the battery cell on top of it. And then you connect potential start. Uh, basically, that's it. And the sample height is automatically adjusted, aligned by software, instrument control software on the XRD instrument. All right. So this is the entire procedure 
uh, to prepare your liquid base lithium ion battery in the battery cell and how you could mount this uh, prepared sample holder to diffractometer. So let me move on. So next video is discussing uh, for solid state batteries. So we need to have a current collector, or this is window for X-ray, typically aluminum. And as I mentioned briefly, so we need to have a prepared, like a pellet style or solid state. So it means uh, we need to pressurize cathode, electrolyte, and uh, anode in a se on a separated pressurizing machine to make it as a pellet form. So we are putting uh, like a support block. So this is actually protecting a very thin window for X-ray because we are going to pressurize uh, when we prepare the sample. This is just protecting the window. So when you measure XRD, this must be removed. So now we are pulling a current, correct, uh, current collector or X-ray window. This is aluminum. And then we put sample holder. And then we need to fix it. So once you fix the sample holder, this is also insulated material. So we are going to place your pellet solid state battery. Yep, so this is the battery itself. So then we put a pressing shaft. And then we put a lid with a very big, like a bolt on it. So we squeeze this bolt to pressurize your sample structure. And in our case, we provide a pre-calibrated torque wrench. And you can squeeze the bolt. Now it's pressurized. And then we finally put the cover on top of the pressurizing board. In our case, we also provide uh, the pressure gauge so that you can confirm uh, the appropriate pressure was applied. In this case, one kilonewton. So then uh, we removed the protection of the X-ray window already. It is not videotaped, but uh, we removed it. And this is diffractometer. So we have a dedicated mount or support for the solid state battery cell. For solid state, because X-ray window is very thin and tiny, so we decided to have uh, this kind of shoot slit. So this slit is uh, controlling the beam size towards the X-ray window so that we don't get any diffraction signals uh, from the outside of the X-ray window. So now we put the solid state battery cell and we are connecting to potential start. This is the same procedure as a liquid-based lithium-ion battery. So basically, this is how it works. All right, so this is the end of the sample preparation. Just in case, did you receive any question, Tim? Uh, none at this time. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I think we should be able to receive some of the other questions at the end of the webinar series, so let me move on. So section number four. So in this section, I'm going to discuss how to set up a potential start and XRD instrument just to synchronize between and how to start the measurement. So by default, in our case, we do support biologic potential start. So this means if you have biologic product, so you don't need any modification in terms of our software or hardware. So then uh, I have another video. So this is showing how you could synchronize between potential start software, which is on the left-hand side, and the X-ray diffraction software, which is on the right-hand side. So let me, let me start this. So first of all, we are checking the status on the diffraction side. Uh, it's a little quick. <laughs> so we defined five to 35 degree scan range. And now we are defining potential start measurement on the left-hand side. And now we started the potential start. Okay, so our software on the left, right-hand side is waiting for a trigger signal for, from the potential start software. So once we receive the trigger signal, so our software starts XRD scans. This is the first scan. So in this specific example, the scan takes only one minute. So while we are doing repeating XRD scans on the right-hand side, but potential start is doing their job on the left-hand side. 
So this is how you synchronize between the potential start and the X-ray diffraction. So already second scan is about started. Yep, so this is how it works. So it's very simple. Uh, as long as you prepare your sample uh, nicely, and uh, you can synchronize XRD potentials out very easily. So once you get the data, uh, in our case, we do also supply a data uh, collection, uh, excuse me, data analysis software, which is called data visualization. On the left-hand side, so we have a potential start profile and XRD data on the right-hand side. You can display both on the same software. And now I'm changing the scale and the dimension of the data of XRD. And now you even you can create a movie. So I'm going to show you how what kind of movie you can create. So I just started. So now, as you see, so depending on the potential start status, so XRD chart on the right hand side is moving and showing the specific moment of the uh, XRD profile on the potential start profile. Or you can specify the place uh, or point on the potential start data like I'm doing right now to see what kind of diffraction data was recorded at this specific time of the moment. So this is the entire procedure, how you could synchronize a measurement and also how you could synchronize analysis uh, from the potential start and X-ray diffraction instrument. All right, just I'm curious if uh, if we received any questions, Tim? Yes, we have a question. Is is two hours a typical length of charging and discharging for a battery experiment? Uh, yeah, so two hour means uh, the one C, right? So the charging speed depends on your battery structure. So it could be much slower, it could be much faster. Uh, it depends on your battery. But the one C is called half cycle, like one hour. So totally one cycle takes like two hours. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. I hope I answered to your question. Uh, if not, so please ask me again at the end of this webinar. All right, so let me continue. Uh, in this section number five, I'm going to discuss a couple of the examples on the operando XRD measurement. The first of all, let me discuss intercalation of lithium ions. This example has a lithium nickel 0.5, manganese 1.5, oxide as a cathode material. So we apply the constant current of 132 milliamps, which is 1C. So it means half cycle takes like one hour, totally two hours for one complete cycle. And anode with lithium carbide. And data shown here is a diffraction profiles. Horizontal direction, X-ray diffraction, If just in case if you are not familiar with, Horizontal scale is always diffraction angle, or two theta, which is degree. For example, this peak was found at 81.6 uh, degree. So this is how we should read it. And the vertical direction, in this case, XRD peak intensity in count per second. For example, this peak was about 10,000, over 10,000 counts per second. So in this charging and discharging cycle, uh, I'm sorry, so let's move on. Yeah, up to here, so we started from charging. So it means while we charge this battery, so the originally the peak was here, move to the second peak here, to then finally move to the last peak here. So we found a three distinctive uh, peak positions while this battery was charged. And when we discharge this battery, so this po peak position became, I mean, returned to the original peak positions, right? Second peak position and the first peak position. So it looks like this reaction is like a reversible. So because charging and discharging showed exactly the same manner in terms of the peak position and the intensities. So let's say uh, we have uh, three phases. This is a crystal structure, so phase A. So this is the first peak position. And this P, this phase A became phase B, and then finally became phase C under the charging. And under the discharging, C became B, then became A. 
So data here is exactly the same data, but different style. So now the vertical direction is elapsed time in minute. So this is one C. So the one cycle took like a, uh, 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 like a, like a two hours. So then uh, we have the first peak here, a second peak here, third peak here for phase A, B, and C. So from the peak search, so means the peak position of the X-ray diffraction profile, so you can identify the crystal structure. So we found the phase A is actually lithium, 100% intercalated into the nickel manganese oxide, like layer structures, and nickel manganese, yes, oxide, a crystal structure. So then uh, phase number C, this is opposite. Almost 100% lithium was out of the structure. So this is nickel manganese oxide. And the phase B, between A and C was found lithium 50% intercalated nickel manganese oxide. But interesting thing is that we didn't see any uh, in between phases, like a 25% or 75% lithium nickel manganese oxide. So it looks like a lattice parameter or crystal shape, or let's say the crystal was about the same. It doesn't matter of the charging or discharging state for each phases. For example, peak position for phase A didn't move it at all. Uh, phase B also didn't move it at all. Phase C also didn't move it at all. But under the charging and discharging, the intensity of the different phases, for example, B and C became larger and larger, larger and larger for phase C while it is charged. While it is discharged, this peak are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is how the reaction happened on the lithium nickel manganese oxide in terms of the crystal structure found by X-ray diffraction. This is another example. This is NMC, nickel manganese oxide. A ratio between was one to one to one. The cathode was carbon. On the right-hand side, so this is a, a potential start profile. So measurement took, uh, this, uh, this is hours, yes. So measurement took like a 20 hours, one cycle. So then uh, the carbon peak, this is a carbon diffraction peaks are uh, moving depending on the charging and the discharging state. And for carbon, so there are four different phases uh, defined by Damas and Herold back in 2018. So they named uh, four different phases as a stage number four, three, two, one. So difference between the stages are how much lithium are intercalated on the graphite structure. For example, stage number four, the graphite is empty lithium. Stage number four, a little lithium are intercalated. And stage number three, are two times more lithium are incorporated or intercalated. Stage number two, three times more lithium. And finally, the fully occupied the lithium site. This is called stage number one. So we started from charging. So at the beginning of the charging, so we started from stage four, which is here. So we had a little lithium on the anode. And while charging, as you see here, the lattice parameters are linearly changing while it is charged. So then finally, it became stage number three. But stage number three and two, as you see here, the lattice parameter didn't change. So it means the diffraction peak angle stayed constant. So that's the reason why you can conclude the lattice parameter for stage three and two didn't change under the charging condition. So then stage number two became stage one at some point. But you see, there is no transition peaks between the stage two and stage one. So it means stage number two crystal structure suddenly became stage number one structure. So this is kind of interesting observation. This can be only found if you have operando XRD solution. What about cathode? The same structure, same sample, same experiment. Now I'm plotting the peak position for cathode nickel manganese cobalt oxide. 
under the charging, you see the peak position of X-ray diffraction is shifting towards low angle direction, almost linearly, but at some point it was saturated. So then the peak shifted towards the opposite direction, which is higher angle side. So this is a point when the battery was fully charged. So when it is discharged, both carbon and also cathode, looks like a reversible process. So means it's almost symmetric between charging and discharging. So this observation on the NMC cathode was discussed in the past, and one of the professors found and explained why and how the C-axis and the A-axis of the NMC crystal changes like this way. It's kind of funny, right? So the C-axis is expanded, but at some point, the C-axis shrinked. So I'm plotting a lattice parameter or lattice constant of NMC crystal along the C-axis and the A-axis, and together with the potential start profile here. So up to 10 hours, this is charging. After 10 hours to 20, so this is discharging. So the crystal structure shown here is discharged state, which is here. So this is when we started. So when the battery was discharged, so the lithium site on the lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide crystal is 100% occupied, almost 100% occupied. So that's why it is green. So green means lithium ion. So then uh, lithium ions are separated by oxygen octahedras. So octahedra has a transition element inside, either nickel or cobalt or manganese. This is called like a layer structure. While it is charged, this lithium ion is moving out of the structure. So that's why this is a partially occupied a lithium site. So while lithium is moving out, oxygen oxygen coulomb force expands the crystal structure because this is negative charged to negative charged. Simultaneously, as a balance of the 3D transition metals like an equal cobalt magnet changes. So that's why after this saturation point, the C axis once again like a shrinked because now there's a valence change of the cath, I mean, the 3D transition metals attract the oxygen stronger than the Coulomb force between the oxygen and oxygen. So this kind of process was pro proposed by uh, Professor Nakamura back in 2016. And finally, it became like a fully charged state, which is a red dotted circle here. So it means uh, some of the part of the lithium is, I believe, uh, occupied. Still occupied, let's say. So that's the NMC and uh, nickel magnet oxide example. Just in case, did you receive any question, Tim? Yes, actually, we received several questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is, remember how you were referring to doing... Um, C-rate testing, one C-rate means you charge in one hour, discharge in one hour. Mm -hmm. So uh, this question is, if you do a C over 20 cycle, mm -hmm. can the software handle that much data? Ah, uh, I see. That's a good question. To be honest with you, uh, I don't know. I need to check. Uh, maybe your question, so you're concerning about the amount of the data, that amount of the data can be handled by the software or not, right? Right. Uh, it depends on how how much you collect the data for potential start and X-ray diffraction. If you collect, like, a, for example, thousands of the diffraction profiles and thousands of potential start data, there might be some software limi limitation. But to be honest with you, I apologize. I don't know the exact answer for now. I may leave the other question. One more question. Yes, uh, if the material I want to scan in my battery is primarily amorphous, should I take the time to do operando measurements with a benchtop XRD, or should I basically skip operando XRD and, and, and look into PDF? 
I see. So if you believe your amorphous material became crystallized, that means the crystalline materials and as operandum procedure, I would recommend to do this kind of operandum measurement, right? And operandum measurement may tell you, so at, at, at which point under the charging or discharging, so your materials became like a crystalline structure, right? So this could be interesting observation for you, I believe. So uh, if so, uh, it's worth to try the operandum measurement uh, XRD. But if you say your amorphous stays amorphous, right? It doesn't crystallize under the operandum condition. So then maybe uh, the only application for X-ray diffraction scattering uh, could be only a pair distribution function. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, I believe we received more questions. So if I have enough time at the end of the webinar, I'm going to address all the questions. Thank you very much. All right, so let's move on. So next example here, I'm going to discuss a C-rate dependence. For this kind of investigation, you may want to have very quick XRD solution because as, as we have been discussing, the one C takes one hour, but two C takes only 30 minutes, right? A five C only takes 12 minutes. So it's getting faster and faster and faster. So if you're working on quick charge battery materials, so you may need to speed up the cycle. But if you do so, the XRD measurement has to be fast enough to see the structure changes depending on the charging and the discharging cycle. So this is one of the solution which is available from us. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be this solution, but just let me explain our solution. So we do have X-ray source on the left-hand side. In this example, we have molybdenum. This could be silver too. And we have pouch cell, sample holder in the middle. So this is a place where you place your pouch. So then on the right-hand side, so we have a detector. And X-ray from the source hit the pouch and diffracted beam is recorded by detector like this way. And as you see, the detector has a very large window along the two theta or diffraction angle, which covers a 15 or 15 degrees. If 15 degree of coverage is enough to see the structure changes under the operandum condition, so now, so you don't need to scan the diffractometer. So by that way, so you can speed up or accelerate your XRD measurement much, much faster compared to the scanning, this is a conventional XRD method. So how fast we can collect the data? So this example is showing NMC pouch. So we had molybdenum X-ray source. We applied uh, 50 kV, 40 milliamps. So this is not the potential start condition just for your information. Uh, and if you're confused, uh, this is a condition for the X-ray source. And we exposed 60 seconds or well, one minute in this example. And as you see here, we collected enough intensity. This peak was like a 5,000 counts of X-ray. This is an MC003, 101, 104 peak here. One, excuse me, 015 peak here. So we got four peaks within the 50 degree, 15 degree of the range covered by the detector by one minute. The other Two stronger peaks are from the pouch itself, aluminum peaks. Let's make it quicker. So this one is recorded by 30 seconds, half minute. Intensity is half, of course, but you see uh, still the NMC peaks are very clear. So this quality of the data is enough to calculate the lattice parameter out of the peak search. Let's try even faster. So this is 10 second exposure time. So even by the 10 seconds exposure with the conventional X-ray source, so I was able to see the clear peaks from the NMCs, those four peaks. So by the way, so you can speed up your X-ray measurement. This is really important for C-rate dependence, uh, dependent uh, operando X-ray measurement. So today I have an example on the LFP. So this is a lithium iron phosphate. And the lithium is moving in and out from the iron phosphate layer structure. 
together with the electron. This is a reaction formula. Let's see how quickly we can charge these specific batteries. So first we started from 1C, so it means one hour. So we use molybdenum X-ray source, 10 second exposure time. This is the same condition as I discussed in the previous slide. So what we try to see is how the X-ray diffraction intensities from both states, like uh, lithium iron phosphate. So I mean the lithium is 100% intercalated in the iron phosphate structure, and lithium is completely moving out. So this is iron phosphate structure. So we see how the intensity between the two peaks are exchanged while charging and the discharging experiment is done by potential start. The peak separation between was very close. So if you have if you have a look at the two theta angle, so we recorded only between 16, two theta up to 16.5, which is less than one degree range. So the peak separation is also important in this case. And peak intensities are summarized on the right-hand side. And as you see, the intensities between the lithium iron phosphate, iron phosphate were completely exchanged. So it means under the charging cycle, so the lithium iron, uh, ion was completely removed from the lithium iron phosphate. Let's make it quicker. This is three times quicker. So now half cycle takes only 20 minutes or so. Under this 3C condition, we also found uh, the intensities were completely exchanged. So it means 100%, almost 100% lithium ions are extracted from the lithium iron phosphate under the charging with the 3C speed. What about 5C? So 5C is five times quicker compared to 1C. Now, the intensity was not exchanged completely. So some of the intensity from iron phosphate remained higher, and some of the intensity from lithium iron phosphate remained lower. So it means not every lithium ions are extracted or intercalated by the 5C condition. So obviously 5C was too quick for this LFP battery. So this is how you can, how you can test your battery uh, to see how fast you can charge or discharge your battery structure combined with X-ray diffraction. And the X-ray diffraction tells you what was the reason the 5C was too quick for your battery, for example. All right, so just in case, uh, Tim, did we receive any question for this uh, example? Yes, uh, here's an interesting question. In a coin cell for reflection in operando XRD, can the X-rays penetrate through both the Kapton window and a copper current collector to analyze the anode material? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you for this. Uh, yes, so assuming, uh, uh, let's discuss first the uh, reflection geometry. So in the reflection geometry, uh, to penetrate enough the copper anode, right, on top, if this is on top of the structure, so I strongly recommend high energy X-rays like a molybdenum or silver. So if you have molybdenum or silver, the copper electrode, uh, most probably uh, the X-ray transmit through the copper. But it also depends on the thickness. If you have a millimeter thick copper, I don't think so, but I'm you know, just uh, exaggerating. But if you have a very thick copper anode, X-ray might be blocked, even though you have a high energy X-rays. So in summary, thinner copper is better for operando measurement. Transmission geometry is the same story. The X-ray must transmit through the copper anode. So in this case, the, cup, the, the thinner is better for transmission geometry as well. And also X-ray needs to transmit through the structure. So that's why for the transmission, definitely we should have either molybdenum or silver X-ray source. And KCK, there was actually a follow-up to that question, part mm -hmm. of the same question, but sorry, it just disappeared off my screen. <laughs> um, it had, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I can bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe I can ask another one. Um, Did you sure want to pick up the question about the coin cell, Tim? 
Yes, if you can bring it back, um, but otherwise I'll move on. If here. you click the uh, answered tab, you'll see it. Ah, uh, sorry. Okay, let's see. Uh, sorry, I, I moved yeah. into the answer. To... <laughs> yeah, the, so we just spoke about how we can penetrate the um, copper uh, current collector on the backside of the uh, anode um, because it's only about 10 to 15 microns thick, so we can mm -hmm. easily penetrate that with with molybdenum, and, and realistically, you can you can penetrate it as well with 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 copper. Yes. Um, but but the second half of the question is, what if the anode material is amorphous, but potentially crystallizes during a cycle? Yeah. So yeah. So amorphous material doesn't show any diffraction peak, but from diffraction viewpoint. Right, uh, so we welcome if your amorphous material became like a crystalline under the operandi condition, and if you uh, crisp, if you, if crystallization happened, so you see diffraction peaks on the XRD, so that you can analyze how the lattice parameter changed under the operandi conditions. But if your sample stayed amorphous, so unfortunately uh, from the X-ray diffraction, so you don't get so much information about the crystal structure. Thank you. All right. But thank we you have a couple question. more questions, but I, yeah, but I'll let you move on and we'll address these questions after, I think. Yeah. So we have four minutes left. So let's move on. Uh, this is a solid state battery. So this example is titanium disulfide cathode and sodium phosphate sulfate as a solid electrolyte. This is a, obviously is a sodium based solid state battery example. So let me discuss this. So we prepare the sample as a pellet form, as we discussed in the sample prep section. section. So then we place a pellet into our solid state battery cell. And we pressurized one kilonewton force or 12 megapascal pressure. So then in this specific example, we use copper X-ray source, which is soft X-ray, because peak separation between titanium disulfide, sodium, titanium sulfide was very close. So we needed to have peaks, I mean, the peak resolution, peak separation uh, resolution. All right, so this is what I got. So along the horizontal direction, this is again the two theta angle X-ray diffraction. And the vertical direction elapsed time in minute. So it took like a 360 minute, so six hours. So what we found is a very strong peak at the beginning around the 34 degree. And this peak intensity became very small as soon as we started charging and discharging cycles. Also, a new peak appeared around 35 degree to theta here as soon as we started the cycles. And this peak actually moved left and right, low angle, high angle, low angle, high angle, depending on the charging and the discharging. Let's see what's happened. So now I overlaid potential start profile. So in this specific example, we started from discharging. So as soon as, as, soon as we started discharging, this peak, 34 degree, became very weak. So from the peak angle, we could identify the phase. And this strong peak around 34 was from titanium disulfide, which is the cathode. And once we started the operando, so this peak, or this phase, let's say, became like sodium titanium disulfide. In more specific, we found sodium 0.55 titanium disulfide. And this peak is moving left and right, so depending on the charging and discharging cycle. So it means sodium ions are intercalated into the titanium disulfide structure and not, so depending on the charging and discharging. Another interesting feature we found is, as you see here, some of the intensity from the titanium disulfide remained until the end of the operando. So it means some of the titanium disulfide cathode remained unreacted. So this kind of investigation can be very easily done if you have operando XRD measurement. Tim, just in case, did you receive any questions? So we are running out of time, but... Uh... Uh, let's see. Yeah, 
There's a question here that says that uh, you showed how the charge discharge speed affects the materials and crystal structure changes. What about multiple cycles at the same speed? Yeah, this is a good question. So this, yeah, so the C rate uh, dependency, if you remember, so I discussed how, you know, you can speed up the potential start measurement if you have a fast X-ray diffraction solution. And uh, so uh, you may combine this kind of C rate uh, dependence measurement for this kind of batteries. Unfortunately, I don't have this example for now, but uh, you can do the similar because uh, you see the peak separation between titanium disulfide and the sodium titanium disulfide, just a couple of degrees, only two or three degrees, right? So the 15 degree large detector should be able to cover both diffraction peaks. So then you can speed up the cycle on the potential start so that you can see if the speed of the cycle changes the you know the phenomena found in the uh, in the crystal structure, but unfortunately I don't have this this example for this specific example. And there's one other question here: Is there any way to calculate or state hysteresis on the cycle during the measurement? Yes, uh, you can. Um, if you remember the C rate uh, dependence, right? Some of the iron phosphate remained as an iron phosphate, some of the lithium iron phosphate remained as a lithium iron phosphate. And the uh, XRD peak intensity corresponds to the relative weight of the phase. So means if you calculate the integrated intensity for each peaks, so then uh, you can discuss these kind of things. All right, thank you. thank you. So let's move on. I have one more example before you go. Um, so this section, I'm gonna discuss temperature dependent operando. So this is how it looks like. So your pouch is now embedded into the blue plastic on the left-hand side. Yeah, so we can see berries. Uh, this is uh, embedded like a pouch, okay? And we connect the thermostat directly to the pouch so that we can monitor the temperature exactly on the pouch. So then we connect the wires. So then we put the white cover or lid on top of the, uh, the pouch. And under this white lid, uh, you can control the environment, either vacuum or inert gas. So let's see what, what we found. So this example is lithium manganese oxide polymer battery structure like this. So it has 17 times 32 times 4.3 millimeter thickness, which is really thick for X-ray diffraction. So that's why we had silver X-ray source in this specific example, just to transmit more X-rays through the 4.3 millimeter thick structure. And we found LMO 111 peak uh, moved left and right, depending on the charging and discharging. And now I am plotting the potential SAT profile. So two white dotted lines are separating uh, different temperature conditions. The first temperature we started from 50 degrees Celsius, and we found the capacity of the battery was 110 milliamps per gram. This is two cycles. Next, so we decreased the temperature down to room temperature, which was 27 degrees C, and we found the capacity was decreased about 20%, which was 93 milliamps per gram. So then finally, we decreased temperature further down to freezing temperature, which was zero degrees C. So then we found capacity was further decreased by 40%, which was 63, 63 milliamps per gram. As you see here, with decreasing the temperatures, capacity of the, the lithium manganese oxide polymer battery decreased as well. How about crystal structure found by XRD? So the peaks are moving left and right, that's for sure. But the question is, is this the same amount or different amount? So it's not clear from this uh, profile, so that's why I calculated the lattice constant from the peak angles. So two yellow dotted lines are showing maximum on the right-hand side and the minimum lattice parameters from the peak positions depending on the charging and discharging. At the higher temperature, so two dotted lines are separated 
larger compared to the lower temperature. So this means lattice parameter changed more than the lower temperatures. And this, the width, right, lattice parameter change is becoming smaller and smaller with decreasing the temperature. This suggests the lithium ion is moving in and out much smaller under the low temperature conditions. So you have a temperature controlled pouch cell holder. So you can observe, you can measure this kind of uh, lattice parameter changes, means the crystal structure changes depending on both potential start, like a charging and discharging, and temperatures simultaneously. Of course, measurement takes longer time because you need to now change the temperatures, but you get more inf information out of the measurement. So this was the last question. Let me ask you one last question before you go. So let me start the last polling question. So which application are you most interested in? You have three choices in the other. First one, uh, C-rate dependence. The second one is a solid state of battery behavior. And the third one is temperature dependence. If it's none of them, you can also choose other. So about a half of the audience answered the question. I hope everybody's still awake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you a few more seconds. Three, two, one. It's evenly distributed. Let me show yep. the results. Mm -hmm. So 40% C-rate dependence, 40% solid state of battery behavior, and 20% temperature dependence. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you very much. So I believe this means, so we chose the right examples in the presentation. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so that's the example for today. And then uh, let me move on. So let me summarize uh, my two webinar series, including previous session. So in, in the previous webinar, so we discussed like a uh, room temperatures, no operando conditions, X-ray diffraction, what kind of parameters you could analyze with the XRD. So we discussed black brain tunnel monochromatic beam configuration with the copper cobalt radiation combined with potentially high energy resolution, a detector just to decrease the background. Uh, depending on the cathode, separator, solid state, electrolyte, anode materials, so you can evaluate uh, different parameters by X-ray diffraction. Today, specifically, so we studied, we learned the battery operando XRD. So we found you can correlate between crystal structure and the electrical properties during charging and the discharging, with and without the temperature control and the C rate control. For this application, so we would highly recommend to use high energy X-rays, either molybdenum or silver to transmit your structure, combined with the focusing monochromatic beam. If you are not, if you don't remember this, please watch out the previous webinar. And potentially combined with large 2D detector to accelerate, the, especially the C-rate uh, operando measurement. And again, so we will have the PDF uh, uh, webinar uh, next February. So please join us too. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.